Our scripture reading is 1 Kings 13, 23-26. So it was after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he had settled the donkey for him and the prophet whom he had brought back. When he was gone, a lion met him in the road and killed him, and his corpse was thrown on the road, and the donkey stood by him. The lion also stood by the corpse. And there men passed by and saw the corpse thrown on the road, and the lion standing by the corpse. Then they went and told, told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. Now when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard it, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient to the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord has delivered him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to him. Well, that is certainly a scripture reading that's hard to ignore, isn't it? A man being consumed by a lion. And we'll be getting to our study this morning in just a moment. First of all, it's wonderful for us to be here. I hope you've had a wonderful holiday season. Uh, We see some that have been traveling back with us now, and we're grateful that they are safe. And uh, it's just wonderful for us to be here. As we look at our reading here this morning, we indeed are looking at a very strange event. What were the events that led up to the, to the demise of the man of God? The man of God, who is God's prophet, we read here, is devoured by a lion. A few weeks ago, we were studying about Elijah the prophet. Remember, Elijah was the greatest of all the prophets of the Old Testament. He, along with Moses and our Lord Jesus Christ, appeared together on the Mount of Transfiguration of Matthew 17, verses 1 through 5. And we also know that there were many other prophets, most of them unnamed in the Old Testament. They were sometimes simply called a man of God. They're just a man of God. Now, we expect to be tempted by low-life criminals in society, But what about being tempted, as we're about to see, by religious people, even by religious leaders? We would call them today men of the cloth. How can something like that happen? And I think perhaps in recent times we can understand a little bit better how religious people, religious leaders can do what's wrong especially as as it comes to pedophiles and that type of thing. Yes, it does happen. Religious leaders are human as the rest of us. If we look at the context of this, we find that this man of God had been sent by God himself to come and condemn the altar that had been established erected by King Jeroboam. Briefly, we know what happened when King Solomon died. Rehoboam assumed the throne, but because he would not listen to the advice of older people and sought rather the counsel of the younger who told him to be hard on the people, that 10 of the 12 tribes rebelled And so 10 of them went with King Jeroboam. And now in an effort to unite his kingdom, had two altars built, two heathen altars. One in the north and the other one in the south. One in Dan and the other in Bethel. In 1 Kings chapter 13, the first seven verses, we read of the order that God gave to this young prophet, this man of God. We call him a young prophet because he's going to be in contrast with the older prophet who will deceive him. 
Beginning with uh, 1 Kings chapter 13 and verse 1, we read, And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Then he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David. And on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense to you or on you. And men's bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart and the ashes on it shall be poured out. So it came to pass when the king Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God who cried out against the altar in Bethel, that he stretched out his hand from the altar saying, Arrest him. Then his hand which he stretched out toward him withered so that he could not pull it back to himself. The altar was also split apart. And the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Then the king answered and said to the man of God, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. So the man of God entreated the Lord and the king's hand was restored to him and became as before. Then the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. When we look at this, we can understand that God is very displeased about this idolatrous worship that King Jeroboam has established here at Bethel, had built such an altar, and he tells him that sometime later, and we'll get into that in just a moment. The bones of these prophets are going to be burned upon this altar. And just so that the king will not think that the man of God is just making this up, he tells them what's going to happen. The altar is going to split. The ashes are going to pour out. And yet when... King Jeroboam expresses his anger against the prophet. He stretches out his hand, and evidently his hand becomes withered or frozen. Anyway, it became useless to him until such time as the God of heaven restored it to him. So we see here two signs as that altar splits so that King Jeroboam will know what God is going to be doing in the future. You see, as we start reading in our text, beginning with verse 8, God had given the man of God specific orders how to carry out his mission. Let's read beginning with verse 8. But the man of God said to the king, If you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you, nor would I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For it, so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall not eat bread nor drink water nor return by the same way you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. And so here we find that God has given the man of God three commandments. First of all, he's to cry against the altar at Bethel. He's to, con to condemn it on behalf of the true God of heaven. Secondly, he's not to tarry there. He's not to stick around. When he finishes his work, he's supposed to get out of there. And thirdly, he is to return a different way. He's not to go back the same way in which he came. 
I've always thought it was rather interesting that there was no misunderstanding on the part of the man of God of what God told him to do. In fact, that's what he tells King Jeroboam. I cannot go home with you because God has given me these commandments. He's told me how to carry out my mission. And so he leaves, and sure enough, he leaves a different way. You know, when I start reading this, I kind of think about Mother Eve. You know, when uh, Satan came to her. And um, Satan starts questioning the commandment of God, and, and she rehearses in the ear of Satan what is she's not to do. In fact, she adds the words, we're not even supposed to touch it. <laughs> okay? And then she turns around and does that which she knows she's not supposed to do. That's what we see with the man of God here. As we mentioned before, God says, I'm not pleased with this altar. I'm going to correct it. I'm going to correct it by a future king. His name will be Josiah. By the way, King Josiah will not be born for another 300 years. And here, 300 years earlier, he is named by name. And what he will do to this altar that King Jeroboam has erected. You might remember Josiah as being the boy king who was only eight years of age when he assumed the throne and he was a righteous king. And that's exactly what is going to happen to this altar of Jeroboam. In 2 Kings chapter 23 and verse 20, 300 years later, we begin reading with verse 19, which says, Now Josiah also took away the shrines of the high places. There were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger. And he did to them according to all the deeds he had done in Bethel. So we're talking specifically of this incident at Bethel with Jeroboam. And verse 20 says, He executed all the priests of the high places who were there on the altars and burned men's bones on them. And he returned to Jerusalem. Exactly as the man of God said it would happen to King Jeroboam. And again, to show the reliability of this prophecy before Jeroboam, the altar was split apart and Jeroboam's arm was immobilized. And then it returned to him. Well, so far, so good, right? He's done his mission. He's going back home another way, isn't he? Until something happens. An old prophet confronted the man of God. We read that there at Bethel was an old man who, had also, who was also a prophet of God. I find this kind of interesting when I read the text. And it causes us to raise some questions about this man. First of all, let's look at verses 11 through 19. They read, Now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. And their father said to him, to them, which way did he go? For his sons had seen which way the man of God went who came from Judah. Then he said to his son, saddle me the donkey for me, 
So they saddled the donkey for him, and he rode on it, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. Then he said to him, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I cannot return with you nor go in with you. Neither can I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For I have been told by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by going the way you came. He said to him, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you to your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. He was lying to him. I'm not saying that. The text says that. He was lying to him. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. You know, uh, when, I, when I look at this, I am really amazed by what I read. First of all, we find this prophet of God still in the northern kingdom. When you read, for instance, in Second Chronicles 11, nearly all of the Levites went to Judah. They didn't have any use for Levites in the northern kingdom. We also see that this prophet, this old prophet, was too weak to speak against the altar. Ever think about that? Why did God have to have to send the man of God from Judah to do the work that should have been done by a prophet already there in Bethel? What brought that about? Well, the prophet that was there was just too weak. He had an opportunity to speak against that altar. And he didn't do it. Which means he was worse than worthless. (laughs) And so he was too weak to speak against the altar. And his sons witnessed the event at Bethel and reported what had happened to their father, the old prophet. This prophet wanted to meet the one who had the courage to speak out. That's what's going on here. This man of God is a a man that is to be admired. He sees something is wrong, God says, you go correct it, he goes and corrects it. The old prophet had not done that. He saddled his donkey. He found the man of God. Where is he? He's under an oak tree. You know what my question is about that? What is he doing under an oak tree? Wasn't he supposed to go back home? But there he tarries. He's told, don't tarry. You get out of there. But that's what he's doing. Under the oak tree. And he invites the younger prophet to come home with him. But at first, the man of God declines, doesn't he? You know, when we wait and not do what God tells us to do, all we're doing is waiting for temptation. The man of God put himself in that situation. God told him how to be safe. He told him how to do his mission and to get out of there. His work is done. And what is he doing? He's tearing. So don't you do that. And now this old prophet is able to catch up to him so he can lie to him. Isn't that a sad situation?
How did this come about? Was it God who sent the temptation? Hardly. He was trying to deliver the, the man of God from temptation. That's why he was told not to tarry. To get out of there. The prophet framed up the lie in order to make himself look good. What other reason would he have had to lie to him? He saw what the man of God was. He saw what he, he himself was. He did not like what he saw in himself. And so he lies to the man of God. Is it all that hard for us to believe that somebody would do something like that? Sometimes people think that they can be righteous just by association. <laughs> that they can, they can look good just simply by being around the right kind of people. Brethren, there is no substitute for character. Sadly, the young man waited for temptation. If you ask him where you're sitting there, are you waiting for temptation, man of God? He'd said no. But that's what he was doing. He didn't recognize that. There while he was under the oak. We too invite temptation when we don't do exactly as God tells us to do. God tells us to flee fornication, doesn't he? A lot of people want to argue about that in Scripture. Well, you, don't, you just don't understand. We love each other. God says, that's not good for you. Avoid those sins that war against the soul, Peter tells us. People say, I can do those things and never be burned. Listen, sin will always leave a scar. We were talking about that this morning, weren't we, in our, in our Bible class? Concerning Jacob and the guilt that he felt when he was about to meet after 20 years, his brother Esau. That was tormenting him all those 20 years because he knew that he had done his brother wrong. I doubt very seriously if there's anybody in this audience today that cannot think of multiple events in their past life with which they can identify this. And it's bothering us even to this present day. Why? Why is it bothering us? Because we refuse to do exactly what God told us to do. Well, disobedience brought death to this man of God. We read that as they ate together, God's word came to the old prophet. Let's continue reading with verse 20. Now it happened as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah saying, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord, and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you. But you came back, ate bread, and drank water in the place of which the Lord said to you, Eat no bread, and drink no water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. He's not going to have an ordinary death. Indeed, he's going to have an early death. This is very hard for us to read. And I'm sure that for the old prophet, it was very hard for him to learn, too. 
for the old prophet cannot get rid of his visitor too quickly. So he has him saddle his donkey. God immediately fulfills what he says he's going to do to the man of God. Let's continue reading with verse 23. So it was after he had eaten bread and and after he had drunk that he sat on the donkey for him, the prophet whom he had brought back. When he was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him, and his corpse was thrown on the road, and the donkey stood by it. The lion also stood by the corpse, and their men passed by and saw the corpse thrown on the road. And the donkey and the a lion standing by the corpse. Then they went and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. That must have been quite a scene. Can you imagine seeing something like that on the road? And the lion just standing there by the corpse? So when the old prophet learned of it, he decides he's going to retrieve the body. Continuing on, we read, Now when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard it, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient to the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord has delivered him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to him. And he spoke to his son, saying, Saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled it. Then he went and found his corpse thrown on the road, and the donkey and the lion standing by the corpse. The lion had not eaten the corpse, nor torn the donkey. And the prophet took up the corpse of the man of God, laid it on the donkey, and brought it back. So the old prophet came to the city to mourn and and to bury him. Then he laid the corpse in his own tomb, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. So it was after he had buried him that he spoke to his son, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the tomb where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying which he cried out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the shrines of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria will surely come to pass. So when he retrieves the body, he has it buried in his tomb. He mourned for the prophet and requested that the man of God's bones be placed beside his when the old prophet dies. You know, this is a very difficult story to read on a number of directions. It seems to be very drastic what God does simply because a man goes home and eats with another man. But there's a lot involved in this. One of the questions that we might want to ask, why didn't God kill the old prophet who lied instead of the man of God who believed a lie? Why didn't he do that? Wasn't that, the, wasn't that worse than what the man of God did? Wouldn't you think so? Was, was not the man of God just honestly deceived? I don't think he was a a bad person, mind you. He eagerly did what God told him to do. It's just when he got through doing what he was told to do and coming back, he disobeyed God. But he did fulfill his mission, didn't he? So why is God angry with him? Why is he angry with the old prophet who lied to him? That's something that we really need to 
consider seriously because it affects you and me. It has to do with us. The man of God was to obey God's instruction. And simply because he was lied to by another religious leader, he already knew what God's instruction was to do. And he didn't do it. And God did not excuse him. You know, in our society today, we have experts for everything. I've got a financial expert. I've got somebody who helps me handle my money and so on. I have experts if I want to uh, do remodeling to my house. I've got people who know how to do that. Tell me what. I've got experts who can file my taxes for me because I don't understand those tax rules. Do you? And they do. And then we have people, and sometimes you find it with our presidents, who have their religious advisors. As though somebody else is going to take care of their religious responsibilities other than themselves. You know, you can't even pay somebody to practice your religion for you, according to James 1.27. That is your personal responsibility. It's also your responsibility to know what the truth is. We're learning here that religious people, prophets of God, can lie to you. And God will hold you responsible. Because you believed a lie when God told you to do something, they told you to do something else, and you did what they told you to do. It is serious business. So what then is your obligation to religious leaders who claim to proclaim God's word? Check them out. Just as you read in Acts chapter 17, the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica. What did they do? There in verse 11. They searched the scriptures daily to see whether the things the apostle Paul was telling them were true. Listen, if an apostle had to be checked out, don't you think I need to be checked out? Huh? Why do you suppose you have an outline of the lesson before you this morning? along with the scripture references and, and the points being made. So you can check them out. It's been kind of interesting the last several weeks since we started putting in the blanks in the, in the bulletin. Because, um, you know, every week we'd, we'd print off a certain number of uh, copies and we have to worry about, well... About half of them are still here, or they weren't picked up. You know what happened last Sunday? We didn't have any extra copies. I finally found one up here in the seat uh, this week, hidden. And somebody, want, somebody wanted another copy, and I keep a few extra copies downstairs. I had to go down there and get one. I said, all the rest of them are gone. Sister Turner asked me yesterday, said, can't find any bulletins. I said, yeah, they're all gone. They are. Yes, they're all gone. You fill them out, you take them home, they're yours. They're yours to consider. They're yours to study. You see, these Old Testament stories are very important to us. A number of places in the New Testament, we find out why. In Romans chapter 15, towards the end of that great epistle, in verse 4, the Apostle Paul writes, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comforts of the Scriptures, might have hope. How else am I going to understand God 
unless I study stories like this. You mean God expects me to do things exactly right? Yes, he does. He's not going to accept our excuses. He's not going to allow us to blame somebody else for our failures. It's our responsibility, and we really need to own up to it. Again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse of chapter 10 and verse 11, now all these things happen to them as examples that they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the earth have come. What is he talking about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? The Israelites wandering in the wilderness, being disobedient to God, and God allows them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until the entire generation, except for two people, die off. That it was written for us to consider, for us to learn. They were bad examples. We're not to imitate them. But they are examples nonetheless. God has revealed to you his truth. You are responsible to know what is true. He's given it to you in his word. He hasn't hidden any good thing from you. He expects you to know and to understand, to love that word and to obey it. God has revealed to you his truth. You dare not accept any other message even if that message did come from an angel. You realize that? Even if an angel actually did come. The the old prophet lied about that. He said an angel told him, angel never told him any such thing. But the apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 1 says, concerning the gospel, even if an angel brings to another message, don't believe it. Okay? And so that's what we read in verse 6 of Galatians 1. Paul grieving over the Galatians, who have evidently have been duped by Judaizing teachers. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so I now say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. He says that twice, doesn't he? Do you think he expects us to get it? If we don't get it the first time, I'm going to tell you again, a second time, you better get it. And people are going off after all kinds of strange teachings. Not found in scripture. And when you point that out to them, oh, you're just one of those Bible thumpers. You're, you're a fundamentalist and all that. Guilty, guilty, guilty. You're not hurting my feelings. Because I'm not the origin of the message that I preached. God is. You have assumed upon yourself to speak for God. And you will answer to God for that. But for, for all of us, We are responsible, first of all, to know the truth and secondly, to obey the truth. What a powerful story from the Old Testament that helps us to understand that principle today. You know, sometimes it doesn't have to take somebody to lie to you. 
Because of sin, sometimes we just lie to ourselves. We convince ourselves certain things are true and they're not true. You know, you just keep repeating and repeating and repeating. At first you know it's not true, but you just keep on hearing it and you say it to yourself until finally you say, oh, it's true. I just created my own truth. No. That's why God's word is in written form. It does not change. <laughs> we do, but God's word does not. Do you love the truth? Have you been obedient to the truth? I can't answer that question for you. As I mentioned before, it's a question that each and every one of us must answer for him or herself. What is your answer? God's told you what to do to become a child of God. We've got to believe in him. And the basis of that faith is the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, Romans 10, 17. We have to do something about our sins, too. Christ died for our sins, but we've got to repent of them. In Acts 17, verses 30 and 31, God has called all men to repentance. We must make the good confession of faith. Also there in Romans chapter 10, one may believe unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You've got to confess that he is the Christ, the Son of God. And you must be born anew of water and spirit. Jesus told Nicodemus, otherwise you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. We are baptized with Christ. Christ gives us his spirit. We're baptized in water, and we receive his spirit, making us a new creature in Christ. You know what to do. What will you do about it now? It's not my invitation that's being offered. It's the Lord's. You don't have to answer to me. You answer to him. What will your answer be? Will you come as together we stand and sing? Frozen in his grace this hour, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb?